And we're live, Theo. Welcome in, everybody, to First Class Fantasy. Uh, this is a podcast that will be recording every single Thursday, and we will be delivering league-winning fantasy football advice throughout the year. And we're also going to have on expert analysts, proven high-stakes winners, who are going to be sharing their insights as well as their strategies. So buckle up, folks, because we're about to win some trophies. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Theo Greminger. I'm the Senior Fantasy Analyst at Player Profiler. I'm also the Director of Podcasting. A lot of you know me uh, from the GOAT District, and a lot of you Player Profiler fans know me from my written work on the site. Uh, I'm excited to announce that this year uh, I'm going to be actively doing a lot of podcasting, uh, which is very exciting for me. Um, some of you saw me this week on the Sonic Truth Dynasty podcast with the Podfather, um, and, and that was awesome. Uh, but today I'm starting up a, a new podcast with, with my man, Billy Muzio. Uh, a lot of you other people know me uh, because I am an active high stakes player in the FFPC and some of the FFPC competitors. Uh, that's kind of kind of what this, this show is about, um, trying to provide some of the best knowledge that we can to help you win your leagues uh, from you know a competitive standpoint and trying to find actionable advice to really help you crush your opponents. And I'm really excited to announce that my co-host is my man, Billy Muzio. Billy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Theo. I, I'm excited for this, man. I, I'm excited for us to, to, to finally collaborate on a week-to-week -week basis. We had always done you know, guest spots on each other's podcasts, and it was like once a month. You were either on mine, I was on yours. We were constantly working together. We're emailing and texting back and forth. So it's great to get us together uh, officially here at Player Profiler and launching our brand new show, First Class Fantasy. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Billy Musio. Uh, I am an expert ranker. Uh, I'm also the director of of Player Profiler as a whole, uh, and and I'm excited for this launch Theo. I'm also a, a a high stakes player myself, a dabble in in the streets of high stakes, and um, I've had some successes. I've definitely had my losses as well. If you're not a high stakes player unless you've had uh, your ass handed to you at least once in your career. Um, and I'm excited Theo for our launch. I'm excited to talk some finding our league winning players here that are going to help us in early best ball drafts. Talk about some of our rankings as well, uh, and just to get the show kicked off. Billy, I think you undersold yourself a little bit. You're you're a ranker, and you're you're an expert ranker, but but you have some receipts that maybe you want to share with our listeners about uh, how successful a ranker you have been the last two seasons. I think I've been on a pretty good run, Theo. I was trying to be a little modest there. I took first in 2021 uh, for the uh, pre-draft rankings, so the, the rankings that uh, you'll be utilizing at the site, Player Profiler, if you head over to the seasonal rankings. Uh, in 2021, I was the most accurate in the industry. Uh, and then last year, uh, 2022, uh, for in-season rankings. So uh, I rank players week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way through week 17 in the season. And then we get graded on those rankings over at Fantasy Pros. Uh, and those were, I finished fourth last year. I kind of fell off the wagon at the last Only two weeks. Fourth, Theo. <laughs> Only fourth? So I fell off the wagon. I was in second place like the final two weeks and just watched my name tick down two spots the final two weeks. So uh, not not salty about it at all, but just a little a, a little disappointed in myself for, for allowing myself to be passed by two more analysts in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, no, Billy is, is definitely a guy where if I'm like in panic mode at, at 1245 Eastern time on a Sunday – I'll, I'll text Billy, uh, you know, and, and try to get his input on a start sit situation because the guy runs pure. Uh, he's he's a very very good player and an excellent ranker. Uh, and uh, Billy, we've you, you mentioned the podcast we've done together. It's funny the the first time that I even got to know you was when you were doing the fantasy data podcast with with Bradley Stadler, a friend of both of ours, and I came on to compete against you in a best ball draft. I think you had, gosh. A B bag Batoba, a bunch of really, really good players on that draft. Uh, and then yeah, I came on Fantasy Data a couple times. And you've been in the GOAT District, another podcast I'm affiliated with as a co-host. You've been in the GOAT District so many times, you were like an honorary GOAT uh, last season. I think we named you that. Uh, and it's yeah, it's awesome to get a chance to, to sit down and, and do this with you on, on player profiler. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm doing the the Sonic Truth Dynasty podcast with Matt Kelly. You you're also doing a, a podcast that's just awesome 
in year two with Matt Kelly. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's the Dominator podcast. That was the the first uh, launch that we did, kind of a dedicated show to high stakes. Uh, we're still going to talk high stakes in that show, but it is going to be, uh, in essence, kind of a, a, a slight rework. We're going to be having you know experts on as well, talking about processes, talking about rankings. It's going to be more of a high level fantasy uh, discussion show. We're going to be talking about strategies and and we're going to be talking about uh, player selection and we're going to be talking about. Um, you know, rankings and projections, and it's going to be the whole nine yards, but it's just going to be designed around making you one, a, a better player two, making sure that you are, 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 you know, looking at things that maybe the average player doesn't look at right. And, and, and grinding in order to become a better player. So um, definitely take, if you haven't taken a look at it, we recorded last week uh, on Friday, it's called the dominator of uh, here inside the channel. So uh, after this is done, I'll, I'll go through an edit and throw a, a, a tag down here in the comments as well. So you can make sure to, to give that a look and I'll, we'll definitely make sure that you take a look at the Sonic truth as well, but let's, let's hop into some football Theo. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Um, this this time of year is 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 a funny because me and you have been drafting since before the Super Bowl. Uh, maybe we talk about we we participate in a in a, in a league called the Hard Way. Uh, this is an FFPC league. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit, Billy, and what we did a few weeks back. Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, hence the name, the Hard Way. Right, the Hard Way is designed to take some of the best minds in football uh, and and some of the best high stakes players, throw us all in a room, and make our lives hell. Right, it's uh, we hate each other. We don't know why we do it every single year. We we sit there and we we complain about being sniped and about you know not being able to get any of the players that we want because the room is so sharp and and so. This draft is designed, one, to kind of create the first layer of ADP as we head into the offseason. So as typically done, like right around Super Bowl time, we get a fresh look at ADP. As we all know, the ADP at this given time, it's the wild, wild west. We don't know who is supposed to go where. Players are being selected anywhere from one to three to four rounds of separation in, in drafts. And so this draft was designed to take some of the best minds in football and to uh, enter in one draft and to hopeful – hopefully make it to the final shoot showdown, but it's not going to be easy. It's the hard way into the championship. And that's what this league was designed for. Uh, and that's what, where we are today. And every single year, none of us are actually even near the top because it's one of the hardest drafts that we draft all year. Uh, but it's a lot of fun for all of us analysts and players to get together uh, and to, to, you know, plant our flags of our players and, and to be able to discuss those on, on future podcasts as well. Yeah, it's 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 a meat grinder of a draft. And I think that for the early best ball one, it's significant because you see where some of the better players are flag planting guys. You're if you sit around saying, Hey, I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna draft this guy in the fourth round, someone's gonna take him in the third. Uh the, the buzz guys will go at a certain time and it, it kind of helps your process. Uh I enjoyed doing that draft with you. Uh me and you have drafted against uh one another a couple times now. We're actually mid-draft. Uh, on a on a draft that we're going to uh, discuss uh, next week, but kind of what's what's your process this time of year, Billy? Um, how active are you doing best balls? And really, like maybe take take a step back and and w when do you start drafting? Like you do the hard way draft, but then do you take some time off after that, or are you continually drafting? Oh, there's no time off in football, Theo. Um, everyone says there's an off season. That's that's a that's a crock of shit. There's never an off season in football, and if you think there's an off season in football, then I think you should reevaluate your process and start looking at ways in which you can become a better player. So the hard way is kind of the floodgate for me. As soon as we draft the hard way, my draft season begins. Uh, I'm not like a Chad Schroeder who waits till August. I just one don't have the patience for that. Two, part of my process is also getting to learn the flow of draft boards, and I think it's important. You know, and even though we're in, you know. February drafting, end of January drafting, it's still important to see where players are going. Even if the ADP isn't settled per se, we're still getting a flow of the board. Like I knew immediately quarterback was going to become a concern this year. I knew immediately that quarterbacks were going to be overdrafted based upon the fantasy output that we saw last year, as well as the uncertainty at the position that we have going into 2023. So I knew that it was going to become an issue, especially when I walked into that first draft after the hard way and I saw Patrick Mahomes go on the one-two turn. I was like, oh boy, here we go. Buckle up. It's going to be a long offseason. Because those who know me, I'm not one, I'm not willing to spend that type of price on a quarterback. However, if that's the way the board's going to flow, I need to create a plan in order to ensure that I have some ownership of these players moving forward. So my process starts in the drafts. Uh, I start looking at uh, at players and I start, you know 
getting a sense of of the flow. I then start looking at players who I identify as maybe a value prior to doing projections just based on the board. After I do about 10 of these drafts, I then go start my projections. So I've already finished all 32 teams. Uh, I've projected, you know, every pass attempt, every completion, um, the completion percentages, the yards per attempt. I've complete, you know, every running back carry, the yards per the yards per carry, the touchdowns, et cetera, across all 32 teams, every single team in the NFL. Those are how we get the projections and the rankings over at uh, Player Profiler. You can head over to the seasonal rankings. And then from there, Dario and I went through, who's our, our director of analytics, and we started going through and, and overlaying into best ball. And then we start, you know, getting the FFPC rankings, which are coming soon. And then we start looking at, um, you know, super flex rankings. And all of these are already at the site over at Player Profiler. And so that process begins with the stress, it then works its way into projections and to rankings. And then from there, I like to take a look at those rankings and projections and then go back into drafts and say, okay, based upon the, the first run, who is being overdrafted, who is being underdrafted. And every single year we can find these values, right? Finding league winners. That's what today's show is about. Finding league winners inside these drafts, especially this early in drafts. You can just, you can, absolutely take advantage of draft rooms based upon average draft position in March and in February, and you're going to be able to win some serious cash. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think that there is a, some people will say it's kind of crazy to draft this early. I think it's, I I'm on Billy's side where you get into a real flow when you draft often, especially when you're drafting often against good people. Uh, FFPC has a $125 entry tournament the never too early tournament. That's going to be the site that we're talking about ADP wise today. Uh, that's a tournament where I've done a couple entries. Billy, have you done a few on there yet? I might've done a few over there. Yeah. yeah. Might have a couple, might have a couple. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit out the amount of numbers for, for IRS purposes, but let's Billy, put it this way, Theo. I think I'm, I'm about maybe 10 or 15 away from maxing the first tournament already. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not quite at the max, but I, I have a few in there. Um, and I have I have noticed a few things ADP wise as well. There's a couple guys that I've uh, circled as values, but I do want to backtrack before we kind of dive into this. You mentioned the quarterbacks, and this is something that me and you actually talked about this past off season. We saw this coming, where the the Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen tier is really really getting pushed up, and in the FF, FFPC, it's no different. You're seeing those guys going extremely early. What has been your process? Have you been diving into that early QB? I think it's necessary, right? Again, like I said, last year I wasn't, and probably not even just last year, just in general, my philosophy as a as a as a player, um, and also as a ranker, because I think these two things go hand in hand. Again, finding the values, right? And being able to pick league winners. People in the past, I feel like, have always overdrafted quarterback. However, after last year, we have seen that the the top end quarterbacks, like the God tier, right? We're talking about Patrick Mahomes, we're talking about Jalen Hurts, we're talking about Josh Allen's. You know, you can mix in um, that next tier of like the Burrows, and you can mix in that next tier of of the Fields. You know, and you can talk about the advantage that you're going to have, the positional advantage of of these top t- top end tier quarterbacks, and what they're going to do for your your fantasy teams, specifically in best ball, where where these these points are really going to matter. And so, I, I think to answer your question in a long winded way, I am I am giving myself exposure to these players. I'm not going out of my way to overdraft these players. However, I find it necessary to at least have some sort of ownership. And so what do I mean by ownership for those who are unaware of the term, right? I, I need to have five to seven percent. I need to have 10 to 12 percent. And it, a lot of it will be designed around how I'm designing rosters, how I'm constructing them, you know, and and also, you know, what divisions I may be focusing on while I'm building that roster. And so I think it's essential to at least expose yourself to to those early quarterbacks. I think it would be causing yourself harm to not have any exposure. I think it's not having any exposure in general to any player is the wrong approach, regardless of how you feel about them. You know, prime example, look at Josh Jacobs last year, right? And so I think that diversifying your portfolio per se, like this is an investment tip, right? Not only in, in, in the world of investment and money, but also in fantasy that we need to diversify our portfolios in order to maximize our profits coming in the, the year. So regardless of how I feel strategy wise, I think it's important to at least add them into your portfolio. 
Yeah, Billy, I think you 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 bring up a, a great a great argument. So in a tournament setting, I don't want to not have exposure to these guys because these guys are the weak winners. And when you talk about needing a massive not massive output from somebody in a specific week, I know Jalen Hurts can go out there and give me a forty five point week. I know Josh Allen can do it. I know I know Patrick Mahomes can do it. I think that the question comes down to me is in a specific like a one off league. I might be less inclined to to dive into those guys, but for for this particular setting, yeah, I do want exposure to it. And I actually liken the rise of these quarterbacks to the tight end position, where the tight end position we've seen the Travis Kelsey tier, the really really elite tight ends that get drafted highly. Those guys usually don't hurt my fantasy team, and it helps me avoid a landmine. So I think when you the argument against these quarterbacks is, hey, I can find quarterback points later. But an, an argument for this kind of a one-off position being drafted so early is it helps me avoid those those wide receivers and running backs that, you know, traditionally can have higher fail rates in that certain round. Uh, so it's definitely a, a storyline that we're going to talk about throughout the offseason. The one thing that I find most interesting with it that maybe you could you could share your thoughts on it, we're in a that that draft together right now. It's a slow draft. I just took Joe Burrow in the fourth round which I felt like based on his ADP, it was it was a fine pick. And I do like Joe Burrow, but right now he's going in the third round. So he's going, so just to, to talk about these quarterback ADPs and not to get too far off subject, Josh Allen is going 21 overall, Patrick Mahomes going 23, Jalen Hurts going 26. Then Joe Burrow has kind of snuck into this tier almost. He's going 30, 35th overall on average over the last uh, last few weeks here. How do you view that? Like you talk about the God tier. Is it is it like a gravitational pull that's going to pull up the wrong quarterbacks? Or do you think Joe Burrow is, is correct being ranked as close as he is to that to the big three? I think every quarterback is is mispriced right now because of the God tier pull, right? So because of the quarterback uncertainty and because the top three, the God, the God tier quarterback is being um oh you know overdrafted in my opinion just because of the, they want that safe floor now. Every quarterback below them subsequently now has seen their ADP rise simply due to the fact of necessity. And then also you look at, again, the uncertainty, right? When I was doing, you know, rankings for like the NFC South, like, dear Lord, help me. I, it was taking me all night. I Every quarterback situation was ugly. And then we had, you know, at that time, the unknown certainty of Derek Carr. We still have the unknown certainty of Aaron Rodgers. Now there's unknown certainty around Stafford. Like there's Lamar Jackson. Like there. There is so much quarterback uncertainty right now. I feel like we've seen the top end of the ADP for, for all these players. I do think that we're going to get some sort of relief in ADP as time kind of progresses and we get a little bit more clarity surrounding the quarterback position. I still think Josh Allen, you know, Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes are going to go in, in at least the FFPC at that 2-3 round. I don't think that we're ever going to see those players again go in round four and five like we did last year. But I do think that we'll start to see at least a half round of relief in terms of ADP as we get more clarity of the position. Same thing happened last year. I remember being in a draft in February, and there was like 22 quarterbacks selected in the top 10 rounds. It was it was, it was was a trend that I did not want to see go on for the entire year. And as we started to get that clarity at the position we started seeing adp kind of loosen up and the names start trickling down the boards as people were able to design strategies inside the draft room to determine which quarterbacks they wanted to stack with because now they knew the quarterback is on x team and they knew they're going to be able to take wide receiver a and stack them with quarterback b and so once we have that clarity we will see some relief inside the draft rooms i believe it's just not going to happen for some time at least until we see free agency hit so I might disagree with you on that one. I think that when you get to the main event drafts, which will start up on the 4th of July, I do think you're going to see some people oh, absolutely. that have been biting at their chops. To, and that's, a, you know, when you start a separate, you know, tournament situation where I think that God tier might get drafted earlier. I do agree with you that the quarterbacks, the price will correct for the below tier. But hey, that's a that's a whole whole nother show. Um, it's really <laughs> interesting talking about it. But I think that's been the most dramatic uh, change I've seen in terms of draft strategy from last year to this year is just the change with with the quarterbacks. Um, wanted to wanted to kind of keep it going here. Um, we're we're talking about this never too early tournament. Maybe you could just kind of remind people what this tournament is. Yeah, the never too early tournament is over at FFPC. Uh, if you use code Underworld, 
uh, you will get a $25 promo. So that $25 will be able to be applied to any draft. So they do have $35 drafts over there as well. That $25 promo uh, allows you to enter uh, into those $35. So you can enter that that for just $10 out of your pocket. Um, and then they have a super flex tournament. They have the never too early, which is just a single quarterback best ball tournament. Um, but we're starting one quarterback. We're starting two running backs. We're starting um, two wide receivers and two flex spots. Um, so it is a, a nice tournament. There's $25,000 up top. And so I think that um, when you look at high stakes, this is a nice entry level tournament into high stakes. And it allows you to kind of dip your feet. The beauty about these tournaments is that they're, you know, in, in this tournament, you know, there's, 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 there's a nice little prize up top, but the pool is small. We're not facing, you know, two, three million entries or, or 500,000 entries, whatever the number is at your favorite, uh, you know, draft site. This number is like, I think 1400, 1500. Don't quote me on that number. I don't have that in front of me, but it's, it's a small amount of entries that you have to face first the field. So that's why I like, you know, some of these higher stakes tournaments. Yeah, it's it's a great tournament. There's also the, the $35 one that, that Billy alluded to. Um, these are great tournaments to kind of get your feet wet. I've, I have a lot of friends that say, hey, I want to play FFPC. Uh, what should I do? You know, this is a great way to see if you if you like the, the structure, you like the software. Um, I think it's a great place to play fantasy. We actually have some really exciting news with FFPC and, and Player Profiler. Billy, what are some of the, the tools that FFPC players can now utilize uh, on our site and coming up this season? So as of today, they're not implemented, but uh, starting next week, we're going to actually have, uh, I'm going to be personalizing rankings around the FFPC. Um, so we will have tight end premium mixed in there. We're also going to have super flex uh, rankings mixed into those as well, if you'd like to do the super flex tournament. Um, but we will have exclusive FFPC rankings that I designed exclusively for um, their tournaments. Um, we're also going to be integrating FFPC ADP into those rankings. So when you when you visit the site, you'll have FFPC as a drop down for the rankings. And you're going to be able to see my ranks and how I projected players based upon my ranking model. Um, and then you're going to be able to look to the right and see the average draft position that is linked to uh, that given tournament at FPC. So right now it's going to be linked to the best ball tournament. That's what we have as 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 a uh, baseline. And then as we get into uh, seasonal drafting, we're going to be able to add the ADP for the uh, um, the players championship, the 350s now. And then we're going to be able to add it into the main event ADP as well. So there is going to be, as we get into drafting season, that'll, that'll change into the different tournaments. But uh, as of right now, we're going to be utilizing the best ball ADP. No, it's awesome. And the chat is lit right now. We've, we've a lot of uh, comments in the chat. Um, we have uh, F famous Jay brought up Anthony Richardson, which I just think for, this is interesting. Billy, when you're doing a tournament, like the never too early tournament, how do you handle the unknown situations? And when I say unknown situations is rookies that we don't have the landing spots for free agents. We don't have the landing spots for, we also have players that we are pretty confident are going to get traded. We have some players we think that might get cut. Do you find that these players are players you find yourself drafting or avoiding? And do you think that they are values or do you think that they are potential landmines? Oh man, that's a loaded question. There's so many different ways you can answer this. I think that, uh, in general, you have to do all of the above. And I'm going to try to explain that as best as I possibly can. You have to lean into uncertainty, right? You, looking at ADP right now, there's players that you can find. We'll get to, you know, those values that in, in shortly, but kind of, kind of a, maybe a precursor into that conversation. We can take a look at um, ADP right now. And I can say the uncertainty of the, Aaron Rodgers situation has driven down the price of Aaron Jones. The uncertainty of the DeAndre Hopkins situation has driven down the price of DeAndre Hopkins, you know, and you can list X, Y, Z name all the way down the draft board and talk about this uncertainty. When you're trying to win a large tournament like this, you have to embrace uncertainty. You have to take risk. If you don't take risk, in my opinion, and you just completely draft vanilla all the way across the board, you're limiting your upside. Yes, you might win your league, but you're not going to win the overall prize. So in order for you to, to, to take a shot at the top, you need to lean into that uncertainty and take some calculated risks. Hope that answers the question. I think no, it does. Good. And I think it's kind of a nuanced question. And, and I, I threw a lot at you there. <laughs> I think that just a little is, bit, yeah, you know, it, it's, <laughs> The fact that it's a tournament setting, and we actually have the one of the one of the members of the the main event uh, champions uh, in the chat. Shout out to Dom Baranyi, um, fantastic high stakes player. Uh, he says that the boring players are the values right now. I think that there's there's an argument with that as well. 
But I do think sometimes there are certain players that go into a best ball draft that say, I don't want to draft these rookies because I don't have landing spots. And, the, and I might end up with a, with a ticket that I have to rip up in a tournament um, if I take the wrong rookie and he lands poorly or he doesn't have that draft capital and really doesn't see the field, won't put up the points for me. I'm kind of on the flip side. Uh, I really do like um, embracing kind of the unknown, especially when it comes with the the rookies. Uh, if you want to catch up on this rookie class, uh, definitely tune in to, you know, listen to the Sonic Truth podcast. We recorded earlier this week. We, we talked about the combine winners and losers. But I find myself drafting guys like Zach Charbonnet and, and Devon A-Chain, where these are rookie running backs that I think will land well. I think maybe the redraft and best ball community is not as high on them because they're not the, you know, the Bijan Robinsons and the Jameer Gibbs is. So I think that if you look at that tier of guys, um, maybe the the Josh Downs type wide receivers, they're pushed down. I'm as con- I'm very confident in the fact that these guys are going to have higher ADPs after the NFL draft uh, than they do today. So I'm willing to dive into that. I think also like a player like DeAndre Hopkins, he's not like mispriced. He's he's going kind of in a correct situation. You're seeing him going in the fourth round. But I do think that if he gets traded to the right situation, his ADP could skyrocket up. There's a there's a chance a guy like DeAndre Hopkins could actually move up, you know, 12, 12 spots or so. So I think that I, I would kind of dive into the unknown, but you want to be selective with it. You don't want to just d- draft these rookies just to draft them. But if you see these values... Uh, it, I think you could end up, uh, you know, coming away with, you know, a player that could really, really help your best ball build. Today we're talking league winners, though, Billy. Um, th- we're specifically looking at rounds three through eight, and people might say, "Why are we looking at rounds three through eight? Well, we have recency bias here. Uh, a lot of these league winners for the last few years um, have had, you know, been drafted in this range. I mean, it take, doesn't take a whole lot to think of Cooper Cup's legendary season. He was going in that, you know, third or fourth round. You talk about Debo Samuel's fantastic season. He was going, you know, eighth or ninth round at, at times. Jamar Chase was in this range. Last year, Josh Jacobs was in this range. Tony Pollard was in this range. Um, we've really seen a lot of these players hit. Do you think that there's a reason we're seeing so many outstanding league winner types coming from this specific range in the draft. Yeah, it, there is. There's a lot of it's uncertainty. It just kind of reinforces what we just discussed, right? And, and a good example of looking at these players and these names is is like the Buccaneers. Like Chris Godwin and Evans right now are, are mispriced in my opinion. And yes, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding their quarterback um, and, and the team in general. But nonetheless, these are proven commodities who have, have been – um, consistent in their careers. I mean, look at look at Mike Evans' consistency with touchdowns and yards. It's just incredible. Godwin in his his target share. So um, there's a. I mean, we can sit here. Uh, do you want me to throw out like a specific name like outside? Well, if we can we can get started with that. Um, yeah, who is? Do you see a guy in the? Let's start with the third round. Do you see a, a third rounder that you really really like? Oh yeah, I I love Ramondre Stevenson this year. And so this is again talking about un- uncertainty, right? So free agency is looming. Um, we know that at least I expect Damian Harris to be moved in free agency, right? And if if we knew today that Damian Harris was no longer a Patriot, how far up the board do you think that Ramondre Stevenson shoots? So I, I agree with you on this one. I think that if Damian Harris, Damian Harris, there's rumors he's coming back. Even if he does come back, I think Ramondre, I agree with you, is completely mispriced. Um, he was the only first or second year player last year to finish as an RB1. Um, he is in a great situation, I think, because I think the Patriots offense will be better this year. And I think he has a chance for more touchdowns scored. We know of his his ability as a receiver. Um, I completely agree with you on this one. I think that there's a fear in some players' minds that Bill Belichick is going to return to his ugly old ways of, of you know running back by committee. But Ramondre Stevenson doing this in year two, and seeing this sort of workload from from Belichick and this sort of usage, I think it speaks volumes to kind of where he's headed this year. I think when we're drafting in main events, I think he's a second round pick. Absolutely, I, I'm projecting him to start going about like pick you know 13 through 18 on average uh, come come like July and August. Uh, and and again, it'll be clarity at at the position for that team. But real quick, pop pop quiz, Theo. This was this was not scheduled. How many oh, targets? Man. How many targets did Ramondre Stevenson have last year without looking it up? 
I know Rough guess. In his, I, I know where he finished among his position. He okay. was third, correct me if I'm wrong, third among all running backs in targets behind Mr. Eckler and Mr. McCaffrey. That's well done, sir. Okay. He was third, 89 targets yeah. last year. 89, Theo. I mean, that is a massive... Tar- that's a massive amount of targets. You know, we're not expecting him to see 89. You know, that was that was I think like 17% target share or something like that. 17.3. There it is. Number four overall at the position in the in the league uh for 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 a percent. Snap share, he was 65.1. It was 12, you know, number 12 in the league. We saw weighted opportunities. He was number six in the league. Reception, 69, number four in the league. Receiving yards, 421, number seven in the league. Now, I do expect to see some sort of regression inside these categories, but I don't expect them to be, you know, the rug completely pulled out. So even even if with, 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 with a modest reduction, he still comes in as running back seven in my, in my, in my early rankings here over at player profiler in, in PPR rankings, I should specify. And I do agree with you. I think he is eventually a round two pick. So right now a full round of value in these early drafts. And it's funny. I actually wrote an article. It was like back to the future, trying to identify this year's RB one overall. And there was a couple of boxes that guys checked off consistently when they when they had their RB1 overall season based on what they did the year before. And I was actually surprised that Ramondre Stevenson was one of the guys that, that made the list. I'm not saying he will be the, the RB1 overall, but I do think it's in the range of outcomes that he has like a top three running back season. So that's a great name. My name was Chris Olave, and that's well, a guy okay. that I know you love. Right now he's going at the tail end of the third round. I, ju- I just took him in the draft where, where – where, uh, we're drafting against one another. And I actually uh, DM'd a friend of ours who we draft against Austin Martin. And I said, I, I think I just sniped Billy uh, on Alave. Um, and I did. So I was Alave, cursing your name. Damn you, Theo! You know, you know, you've, uh, you know, you've had a good draft when, when Billy's cursing you out. So uh, Alave is <laughs> a guy I love. I, I love the profile uh, coming out of Ohio state. He was tremendous as a rookie. Uh, he dealt with some adverse uh, situations at quarterback, but he still put up the numbers he went over 70 receptions, over a thousand yards receiving as a rookie. He checked off all the boxes in terms of target share. He had a ton of air yards. And I think it's looking more and more like his offense. Getting Derek Carr, a lot of people like were so unenthused about the Derek Carr, you know, acquisition. I don't really care what Derek Carr does in terms of wins or losses, but I am very confident that Derek Carr is going to help a player like Chris Olave. Derek Carr has a good arm. Derek Carr will provide more consistency than Olave's ever had at quarterback in the NFL. And, and Derek Carr does one thing very, very well for us as fantasy players. He feeds his number one target consistently. The last four seasons, Derek Carr has supported wide receiver three overall, Devontae Adams last year, wide receiver 11 overall, Hunter Renfro two seasons ago. And then the years before that, he had two top three tight end finishes with Darren Waller who's used a little bit more like a wide receiver than a lot of tight ends. So Derek Carr really elevates his number one target. I think that the narrative that he ruined Amari Cooper, Amari Cooper had uh, a wide receiver two season as a rookie. It was like wide receiver 21. Then he followed it up with a top 15 wide receiver as a second year player. And then the, you know, the year three was the one he had problems in. So Derek Carr throughout his career has been able to support his main target and I think Chris Olave is a wide receiver one this season with top five wide receiver upside. So he's a guy that I'm trying to get as much exposure to as I can uh, right now in these drafts. Anything to add on Olave, Billy? Oh, man, you summed it up really well. I love I love Olave this year. I mean, a lot of the reasons that you just mentioned, you know, for a rookie to come out and see um, the success that he did. And we liked him in in the the preseason last year, we hyped him up on the dominator show with, with me and, and, and Matt Kelly, the pod father. Um, but he came in and he was able to deliver. I mean, air yards, 1,670 air yards. He was number eight in the league. And so looking at that metric and I know air yards and everything, but it is a great indication of future success um, for a receiver. And he was already a success in my opinion, but it just, you know, 
kind of re-emphasizes the 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 storyline of him being targeted, of him having the opportunity to succeed. And you hear me talk about it all the time that opportunity is king in fantasy football, and especially you know at the wide receiver position, you need targets to succeed. You need the receptions, and you can't get the receptions unless you're getting the targets. So the fact that he was able to come in his rookie year, deliver over a thousand yards, seventy-two receptions, to come in with you know nearly seventeen hundred air yards. Love it. I, I do like the addition of Carr. Uh, I do have some concerns. The nonetheless, I agree with everything that you said in terms of of you know him being kind of hyper focused. Um, I, I do want to see you know Carr does have kind of a. Um, a, you know, maybe a stain that he only focuses the receivers who are able to get clear separation. Thank God that Alave is a, a great route runner and is going to be able to get that separation. I think that that's going to help him. I just want to see Carr take chances and get him the ball more. So we'll see how that works out in 2023. But I agree with everything you said and agree that Alave is a, is a value in drafts right now. Yeah, they certainly gave Carr the bag. Big, big contract for, for Derek Carr in New Orleans. Uh, I'll start out for, for round four. Uh, one player that I'm really excited about where he's going currently is Tony Pollard. Uh, Cody Cody Carpenter uh, really, really uh, put a sour taste in my mouth with his, with his mock draft where he's got B. John Robinson going to Dallas, which would totally change what I'm saying about Tony Pollard. But let's say Cody's wrong on this one and somebody – or let's say somebody takes B. John before Dallas gets a chance to pick because you know Jerry's salivating getting, getting B. John, uh, you know, in, in a Cowboys jersey. But I think right now where he's currently going – Tony Pollard is a massive value. Obviously, this, this ADP was kind of influenced by before he signed his franchise tag or before the franchise tag news came out. But I think that Tony Pollard right now, if he can avoid a really, really exciting prospect being drafted, I think Tony Pollard will, will rise in terms of his ADP. Um, he's another guy kind of closer to Ramondre Stevenson, I think, in terms of where I'm going to have him as a running back. He's got two-way ability. I think that the Schottenheimer offensive coordinator job for Dallas might help Pollard because I think Schottenheimer has had some success with running backs. Um, and I think Mike McCarthy being more active in his role as, as with the offense um, is going to always kind of lean towards the running back. Pollard's a guy where I think this is his year. Zeke is not going to be back in Dallas. And even if Zeke is brought back, it's going to be on some – you know, hey, let's give him a small contract, let him be the backup. More likely than not, he's gone completely. And I think we finally get a year of seeing Tony Pollard with a full workload. I'm really excited about that. I think that he's, you know, shown his ability um, to be a really, really successful two-way talent. And that's a guy that I love drafting, you know, right at that 3-4 turn. Right now he's going at pick number 37. I expect it to rise, so I would try to get in there um, and, and make your picks with him. Uh, in these early drafts, because I think that this test discount's going to disappear. What do you think about Pollard, Billy? I do think the discount's going to disappear, especially if they do move on from Ezekiel Elliott, right? Like right now, I have Elliott projected for 100 and I think 78 uh, carries. You know, if you remove that out of the equation, uh, you know, I mean, unless Bijan does land there, if Cody's mock is right, if Cody's mock is right, uh, this this conversation gets thrown out the window. But if it's not, um, I think that you're going to see Pollard probably climb all the way up to round two, in my opinion. Um, he's going to be one of the, the most for sure running backs that we, you know, electric running backs inside the NFL with, now with a um, guaranteed workload, not only one in the rushing game, but also the passing game. So I, I think it, his ADP climbing is going to be um, completely dependent upon Ezekiel Elliott. Um, I, I don't think he climbs unless we get, you know, him moved. He'll probably climb a half round regardless. But when I say climb, I mean like a full round, right? We want yeah. value. And so I think that if he's moved, I think we're going to see that ADP really correct because we have, you know, one of the most explosive backs in a guaranteed role. Yeah. Um, and everybody who's listening in on this, I highly recommend you check out Cody's article. It's on the site. Cody does a full four round NFL mock draft. Uh, Cody was at the combine. Cody's very tuned in. It's one of the best mock drafts you're going to find on the entire internet right now. Uh, Cody's really, really bringing the heat. Billy, who is a guy that you're looking at in the fourth round that's getting you excited right now to draft that you think could potentially be a league winner? Can I can I cheat and do the fifth round? Sure, you can do two. You can do you, you can skip the fourth round entirely. I already gave, gave Tony Pollard. Okay, yeah, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I, should, I can stay in the fourth. I, I, I am going to stay in the fourth. I'm going to go back to the well, and I think it's DeAndre Swift. Um, 
when you look at games in which he was actually on the field and utilized correctly, this is the key being utilized correctly um, inside this offense. I think that we have the potential to see arguably the RB one in football in Deandre Swift. I'm not saying that he's going to be the RB one, but I'm saying that he has the upside and the ability to become the RB one in football. One, he is dynamic in the passing game Two, this offense is starting to catch fire. We look at what the lions did down the stretch. And I think had they had done that maybe three or four weeks earlier, they would have made the playoffs and potentially even, you know, finished first in their, in, in their division. So I look at what the lions are building and with Campbell. And I think this team is fully on board. We also know that, you know, Jamal Williams is an impending free agent as well. There's a lot of uncertainty in, in relation to the workload that in the split that's going to happen in Detroit. Um, if they don't bring him back, we do fully expect them to sign a running back or at least draft a running back. One of the two. Um, nonetheless, I think that, Either way, you can look at this and say that DeAndre Swift is going to see his workload increase. I know there was a spurt last year where it was pretty scary, and he was running behind Justin Jackson, and he was only seeing 17% of the of the snaps or 30% of the snaps. So there's definitely you know cause for concern in terms of the workload that we saw out of DeAndre Swift. But I do believe that's baked into the cost because if we knew, for instance, that he was going to see 45 to 50 percent of the snap share any given week, he would not be in round four right now. He would be in rounds two and three again on the turn, if not higher, because of the upside that he has. So there is a lot dependent on his rank and his projection. That being said, I, I have the faith to believe that they are going to uh, be giving him more workload regardless of what they do in the draft and in free agency. And I think that he is mispriced right now in draft rooms. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. And I think this is kind of a little bit of diving into the unknown. I think there's also a pass where even if Jamal, Jamal Williams is back in Detroit, uh, DeAndre Swift, Swift is still a value. All, all you need is a, I mean, it was like a perfect storm for Jamal Williams. All those opportunities inside the five yard line, if they just go down a little bit, um, they could go down significantly even if he's back. DeAndre Swift, we know he can put up a high points per game average because we've seen him do it twice. We saw him do it as a rookie, and we saw him do it as a second-year player. There's such an overcorrection in his ADP. Last year, you were seeing DeAndre Swift kind of go in that, I'd say, 10 through 16 overall sweet spot. People were very happy to get DeAndre Swift in that range, and now you're seeing him going down to close to pick number 40. He's 40 on the nose right now. Uh, so that's a that's an interesting one, uh, and I'm into that one as well. The a player that I'm really into in the fifth round is Drake London. I think Drake London is a tremendous value right now. I think that you have to look at his season based on how he finished it. Um, I'll, har I'll harken back to Amon Ross St. Brown, where if you look at Amon Ross St. Brown's total rookie season, uh, it was less impressive as if you looked at how he finished over the last like six games of the year. Drake London started seeing uh, wide receiver one type volume as the season ended. He averaged nine and a half targets per game, I believe over his last five, Billy. I'd have to double check that, but it's either over his last four or five games. He was at nine and a half targets a game. Uh, he, he showed a connection with Desmond Ritter where Ritter was really looking for him. And I think that D Drake London also is a guy that played at a very young age as a rookie. He was able to get on an NFL football field and look very good, like a proper alpha as a very, very young rookie wide receiver. So I think, you know, he could very, you know, age wise, he could be in this draft class, but he has a year of NFL experience. He projects as a proper alpha. And I think that the sky is the limit for Drake London. When we start looking at a guy and we say, who could give me double digit touchdowns out of this round? I think it could be Drake London. Um, I think he's going to get an appropriate amount of targets this year, and I think he's going to produce, I'll call him a top 15 wide receiver, and right now you're getting him as a low-end wide receiver too. Damn, you feel you keep taking all my guys. Like, how am I supposed to? I'm, I'm looking down. I'm like, I already got my guy figured out. I'm going to talk about Drake London, and then Theo comes in and takes Drake. Well, share your thoughts on Drake. You London. snipe me on Alave yeah. in the draft room, Theo. Now you're sniping me on Drake London in the podcast. What am I supposed to do over here, Theo? I mean, it's 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 easy it's easy to like Drake London, man. You like proper alphas, Billy, and and you you always have a deference towards drafting wide receivers, but it's pretty easy to get there. 
Uh, man, I loved his target rate last year. Number two in the league, 32.4%. Uh, target share, 29% last year, last year, Theo, number five in the league. And I know we're expecting this offense to, um, they're, they're, they're predicted to be still be a pretty run heavy offense. I know there's some quarterback uncertainty. Uh, trust me when I was doing the projections and rankings, I wanted to throw up when I was doing this division at times. That being said, we know the target share is going to be condensed between him and Pitts, right? We know that they're going to get the running backs involved in early and often, but at least we know where these targets are going and it's going to be between the two alphas, Drake London and Kyle Pitts. There's a lot to like about London. London last year was my rookie, my rookie one. Um, behind Wilson, I should say, in my pre-draft rankings. But then once the landing spots hit, I actually moved London ahead of Wilson. Shame on me, but here we are. I'm dealing with the, the repercussions afterwards. That being said, I do think that Drake London has the opportunity to 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 outperform his average draft position right now. I'm going to guarantee pretty much it does as long as he doesn't get hurt um, because there's a lot to like. You look at his air yards, you look at his target share, you look at his target rate, you look at his snaps. He was on the field early and often. Shame on them for not getting him the ball more frequently. I do think we see him get the ball more, and I really like his 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 outlook for the 2023 season. Yeah, I like that one. I also just throw out that I think Jameer Gibbs is interesting. Um, J Jameer Gibbs right now is running back 18, and I think that he'll go higher. I think that he's going to land well. We saw a really good combine from him. So, like, with a lot of uncertainty at the running back position, there, there's less uncertainty with me with Jameer Gibbs uh, for where he's being drafted. I want to take it to the next round, and, Billy, maybe you could start this one so I don't snipe you. There's a certain wide receiver in Los Angeles. I'd like to hear your thoughts on him and anybody else in this round you think is it looks like a proper value. Yeah, I, I like Mike Williams again. I mean, when we take a look at this offense, I love the signing with Kellen Moore coming in as the offensive coordinator. I think it was a mistake that Dallas let him go. I do not think it, you know, their misfortunes was was a result of his play calling. You know, yes, he had his his down moments, but overall, he's had a lot of success in this league as an offensive coordinator. And I really like the fact that he's going to be working here with Justin Herbert. Um, you also add in the the uncertainty with. Um, you know, the rest of the offense or I'm trying to think of right now. So you, you look in, so there's news that they might move on um, from Keenan Allen. And I don't think it happens. Nonetheless, you can see now that um, Allen is maybe not necessarily their focus. Right. And the, in the new world here inside the chargers offense, I think that Mike Williams surpasses um, Keenan Allen as the number one, you know, targets, Maybe not, but yards, absolutely. The biggest concern with Mike Williams always is and always will be his health, right? He's the only receiver in the NFL that can land on his head and his ass in the same play. And so I think that um, when you look at his ability to go up and catch the ball, you look at the offense as a whole, Justin Herbert, you know, coming off of injury, coming in into 2023, he's going to be fresh. He's going to be healed. Um, they have a new offensive coordinator who has done wonders at his position inside the NFL. And in my opinion, you know, catapulted deck um, career. Um, I do think that Kellen Moore is going to be able to get the most out of this offense. And I think that he's going to come in with creative plays. And I do think that Herbert being healed, because I think a lot of people misunderstand Herbert last year and they look at it and say, oh, he underperformed. Yes, he did. But he just came off shoulder surgery. He also had broken ribs, right? He wasn't himself last year, and that's because of the injuries. And so coming in now to 2023, fresh and healed, new and bright offensive coordinator Lombardi's gone, thank God. We have Big Mike, in my opinion, Miss Price, going to outperform ADP and could potentially be the wide receiver one on this offense, who is a high-powered offense who's throwing the ball a lot, Mike Williams is going to be, you know, a big value inside leagues and could be a potential league winner. Yeah, and I think it's interesting in, in terms of a best ball draft, you, you know, based on the way you build teams, Billy, like the the idea that Mike Williams will miss a few games, you know, the knocks on him, you know, having in, being, you know, having injuries in his career – with the well-built best ball team, that kind of goes out the window because the spike weeks are really going to help you, and you you most likely have depth in your wide receiver position. So I like that one a lot. All you need to look back is how Mike Williams started for the first half of the 2021 season where he was right there with Cooper Cup, and then obviously it, it all came crashing down. But you could see a guy who could have you know multiple wide receiver one weeks 
Um, and I do think that Kellen Moore is going to be a, a real benefit to that offense. You bring up Herbert, played it hurt last year, had his lowest finish in his career um, in terms of where he finished as a QB. You're talking about a guy with a top three finish. Uh, he finished his QB three once in his career. Um, I think more he's more likely going to get inside that top six uh, QB range this year. And I think the market is also a little low on Herbert. Um, I think that, you know, Kellen Moore has a lot to prove in himself in a new job. And I think that the Chargers could put up a lot of points this year. So I really like your Mike Williams call. I hate to stay on track with the second year player. And I think that this is a guy that does have a lot of risks in his outcome. But in terms of league winner, for me, it's got to be Christian Watson. I really like Cam Akers in this range as well. I think that he's pretty safe in terms of He's a guy that I think is going to return value based on what he is. He's RB24. If he stays healthy, he's going to finish higher. But in terms of league winner, Christian Watson could be that guy. I think that in terms of the sample size is smaller than you like to see. We certainly have less information about him as we do a Chris Olave um, or a Drake London. But Christian Watson just looked different to me. He had a number of big-time fantasy outbursts. But to me, it's just how he looked with the eye test. The guy looked like Tyreek Hill, explosiveness, being able to run away from defenders, having next level speed, and also having an eye for the end zone. To me, Christian Watson's the kind of guy that maybe he fails, but if he hits, he could really, really hit from this range of the draft. And he's a guy that I was wrong on coming out of college. He looks better than I ever thought he would have. Um, and I think he's going to prove a lot of people wrong again who are fading him this year. The fact that Aaron Rodgers is most likely not a Green Bay Packer, um, to me, kind of goes out the window because I think that a Jordan Love could potentially have tunnel vision for a playmaking wide receiver like Christian Watson. So I think he could make up for, you know, maybe some shaky QB play uh, with a higher target share. What are your thoughts on Watson? He's a little bit polarizing right now, Billy. Very polarizing. Uh, I have mixed feelings about Watson. Um, I, I do think that um, he has the ability to be very successful in this league. And, and I think anyone who would say out otherwise is, is, is just, you know, maybe salty about what happened last year. He went on that streak last year. That was just unimaginable and unsustainable at the same time, but he was, it just showed you the upside and the talent that he has. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty around the, the quarterback position there, though. I don't think that it's going to take that much of a hit if Love is the quarterback because we saw uh, them in game together last year as well. So I think that um, the chemistry is still there. I think the offense is still going to perform regardless if Rodgers there or not there. Um, I do think he's not going to be – he could probably, probably loses a round in ADP, but – Still, nonetheless, I think that he has the ability to outperform that based upon his skill set. And I think that um, he has probably one of the highest ceilings of any receiver in the league right now. So we're, we're at the 52-minute mark. So we'll, we might as well move through the, the seventh round pretty quickly. I'll start out with my guy in the seventh round. Um, se seventh round, to me, it's Tyler Lockett. It's an older player. It's not as exciting as some of the guys that I've talked about. But we do have certainty with the Geno Smith is going to be back in Seattle. We've seen Tyler Lockett beat his ADP so many times. <laughs> and I think that this is just another year where Tyler Lockett going as wide receiver 32 right now. If he stays healthy, why, what, Tyler Lockett is going to be inside the wide receiver two line. He also has potential for spike weeks. Uh, I think Tyler Lockett is just a tremendous value. Even though he's an older player, I think the market is just a little bit off for him right now. Maybe quickly your thoughts on Tyler Lockett and then the guy you have in this round, Billy. Yeah, I think eventually the year will come in which we can't default to Tyler Lockett over DK Metcalf anymore. Whether that's this year or not, I don't know, but I think eventually it does happen. Um, Lockett continues to produce, continues to be the deep threat, continues to make big plays. Uh, they do lose. Uh, some receivers and some targets inside for agency. So as of 2023 projection wise, I still haven't projected to outperform ADP right now inside the FFPC. So I agree with, with, with this take, uh, Theo, I approve. And how about you, Billy? Do you have somebody in this round? Yeah, I do have somebody in this round. That's going to be Deontay Johnson. I mean, I know he had a bad year last year. It was probably one of the, um, most inconsistent in terms of, you know, touchdown production from, from Deontay Johnson. Uh, he had zero touchdowns last year, you know, where you saw eight the year before seven in 2020. Um, 
but nonetheless, he's a target monster, right? 144 targets in 2020, 169 targets in 2021, 147 last year. Uh, they did have some offensive inconsistencies. He only had uh, 82 receptions of those 147 targets. He only had 882 yards. Uh, nonetheless, I think that's the floor, right, in terms of what we can expect from Deontay Johnson. Uh, there's only one way to go, Theo, in terms of touchdowns. You know, you can only go up from zero. So I think that – we are going to see him maybe not necessarily get to eight or seven, but I do think even at five or six, um, if we knew today that he was going to score five or six touchdowns, which I haven't projected for, if we knew that today, I guarantee he is not a seventh round pick in, inside best ball right now. He's probably back into the round four and five range based upon his production and his his uh, opportunity share inside this offense. It's a little bit like DeAndre Swift, Billy, where it's, it's just like stocks. It's a mispriced asset. A year ago, Deontay Johnson, you know, people were excited to get him when he fell to them in the fourth, and now you're getting him down in the seventh. Um, I think it's an overcorrection, and you made a great, great uh, point with the podfather on the dominator. If Deontay would have just simply had four touchdown catches last year, like a low number like four, even I think three. people, even three, people <laughs> would have been way more, way, way less like unenthused with him. And I also think the fact that George Pickens and Pat Fryermuth have a lot of love, um, it's kind of like molding those three together where their ADPs are almost kind of converging and they're very close in ADP where you want to go with the guy that you know could have a very high target share. And that is Deontay Johnson. I really like that pick a lot uh, for the next round. It's, it gets a little bit more difficult trying to find a league winner. Um, for me, there's a few really, really good values, but I will say I like James cook a lot in these early best balls. I think if James cook survives free agency and the draft, the Buffalo Bills offense really needs to take a look in the mirror based on how they did in the playoffs to go out. And I think that James Cook is an explosive player. I think he has two-way ability. I think he's the kind of player that could rise up in year two and give you like top 18 uh, running back production. And right now he's going as a, as a running back three. So he's running back 28. Again, this is, this is projecting uh, the Bills not to go out and get, you know, a Bijan type. But if he can survive the next few weeks – then I think the James Cook's ADP will rise up. And I think the little bit of self-scouting on Buffalo's part, they'll start utilizing that second year back. I agree with everything you just said. And I think that it's it's very dependent upon the draft, very dependent upon free agency. But we saw them start to commit to him down the stretch and into playoffs. I think that even with that level of commitment, even if they do have another back in the equation, I still think that he is mispriced inside draft. So I completely agree with that take. I'm going to take a different approach here, my player, and I'm going to talk about a league winner by not drafting them. And that's going to be Calvin Ridley. So you look at Calvin Ridley, and we know that he has the talent. However, people forget now that Calvin Ridley is 28 years old. He hasn't played football since week seven, 2021, Theo. And it wasn't a full, wasn't a full year then. Coming off, you know, a long stunt being off right now is never good for an NFL career. Look at Deshaun Watson last year. Everyone drafted him as a, you know, upside potential top five quarterback again. You know, I expressed concern last year, him coming off one to a new offense. Okay, here we are. We had Watson from one team to the new team, new offense, new coach, new system, everything. What do we have here with Ridley? Ridley just got traded to the Jaguars, right? Hasn't played football in a year and a half. We went from a new coach to a new coach, went to a new offense, new set of skill players. There's a lot of similarity in terms of these two players and the time off in which they took. From a rankings perspective and projection perspective, you can't help but be concerned about his age and the time off, and not to mention the amount of weapons that now the Jaguars have as well. He's being drafted right now as wide receiver 29 inside the FFPC, 60th overall. At that cost, I'm not going to own too much. Yeah, and it's super interesting to me to see that Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk have pretty much identical ADPs right now, where we've seen Christian Kirk is, is – Christian Kirk is now going to be in his second year in the system. He has familiarity with Trevor Lawrence. We've seen what he can do with Trevor Lawrence. Christian Kirk had a top 15 uh, wide receiver finish last year, correct me, 15 or 16. He was right there in that high, high end uh, wide receiver two range. It, it just seems kind of like an overcorrection. Um, I'm rooting for Calvin Ridley. I really enjoyed reading what he, what he put out on the internet this week, but I think people are, it's almost like hopeful drafting. We've seen him have a big time season. When you sit out of this league, it is difficult coming back. There's not a whole lot of guys 
who have, you know, sat out and not played football and were able to come back like this. So to me, he's a guy that I'm maybe not quite a, as a, an, an avoid when he, when, if he falls in the draft, I'd consider him, but I do think that he's going to end up going higher than, than a spot that I, I I'm willing to take him. So I think that's, that's just a great call, Billy. Billy, why don't you share with everybody uh, kind of what we're going to do next week uh, here on First Class Fantasy? We're going to be discussing. So right now we're currently in an FFPC best ball draft. We're going to uh, dive into um, that draft, analyze each other's picks, criticize each other's picks, yell at each other for being sniped inside the draft. Damn you, Theo. Um, we're going to just kind of really dive into ADP a little bit deeper. We're going to talk about position theory. We're going to talk about um, the player selections in those draft. And then we're going to just look at the flow of the draft room in general. What else, Theo? Yeah. And we're going to get to our fades. We, we, we were enjoying speaking so much today that we really talked about the positive. We're going to talk about some guys that we really want to avoid um, and try to help you out with that. We're also going to look at some of our favorite selections from round 10 through 15. And we're going to look at guys that are currently going in rounds 15 through 20 that we think could really, really pay off for you. I think a lot of times people kind of brush those picks to the side, but those are the keys to really, really hitting in best ball. This was a lot of fun today, Billy. It was great. I love just sitting here. I could talk football all day long, you know, especially when we talk about draft rooms, talk about rankings, talk about projections uh, and the player selections and how we're going to, you know, win those leagues. So I enjoyed our launch, Theo, of First Class Fantasy. Um you know, I hope everyone who participated with us enjoyed the content that we produced uh, and was able to take some notes and and go and apply it now inside a draft room over at FFPC and and to be able to take advantage of of the mispriced players uh, inside those rooms. Theo, any any other closing comments? No, awesome first show, Billy. I can't wait to keep this going. Yeah, I likewise, everybody. Uh, see you all back here next week. Make sure to tune in. Thank you for joining us on First Class Fantasy. Have a good evening. Hey, you like that video? Be sure to subscribe and activate those alerts so you get notified as soon as new videos drop. And be sure to check out playerprofiler.com. We have all the tools for you to dominate every type of fantasy league. We have a draft kit, Dynasty Deluxe, Data Analysis, DFS Dominator, and don't forget the player rankings to rule them all.